OK, so today's lecture is on extensions to VAEs, right? So last time we introduced the basic variational autoencoder. And I want to talk today about kind of like an advancement to the VAE that turned out to be even better. And so um, today is kind of two parts. The first part is basically extensions of VAEs, in particular something that's called the VQ VAE, which stands for Vector Quantized Variational Autoencoder. And we'll talk about what that means in a couple minutes. Um, and then also, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, image quality metrics, right? So we noticed last time that the images that were being produced by the VAEs were a little bit blurry, right? And so we would like to have some sort of quantitative way of measuring how good are the images that come out of any given generative process, right? I mean, obviously, you can have user surveys, and people can vote on which image they like better. But ultimately, we want to have something that's kind of quantitative that we can, in theory, optimize for, and that we can benchmark different algorithms to see which one is producing better images. And so I want to talk about that problem a little bit also. So um, just to say what I just said, right? So we noticed, for example, that um, last time, you know, the VAE output can be a little blurry, right? And actually, let's talk a little bit about why that is, right? So for example, we know that what's happening is that the VAE is taking a input and it's mapping it down into a Gaussian PDF in latent space, right? So kind of what's happening is that if I have one input, I have a mean and a covariance, which I could represent in 2D like an ellipse. And if I have another input, I have a mean and a covariance that I represent like this, for example, even though it should be a little more centered. Forget this guy. OK. And so now I'm going to sample from this space, right? And so the reason, or one reason these outputs can be sometimes kind of blurry is that if I generate you know, a sample like this, which is you know, arguably kind of like one standard deviation away from either of these means, that the generated sample kind of has to be consistent with both of these inputs, right? And the consequence is that there's a little bit of blurring, right? Because it's kind of fighting to be good for both of these disparate inputs, right? That's a very hand wavy reason why things are sometimes a little bit blurry come out, coming out of VEs. And so one thing that we're going to do today and then moving into next week when we talk about GANs is, you know, we really want these generated images to be sharper, right? That's important for some sort of visual, um, you know, pleasantness, right? Um, the other thing that I uh, want to talk about is, um, you know, so one thing is that, you know, um, data distributions in the latent space overlap. That's kind of one reason why there's some blurriness. Another reason is that, you know, if we go back to our loss function, right, kind of our loss function was how similar is the original input to the decoded, encoded output, right? We want those things to be close. And if you look back at what cost function we were talking about, we were really talking about the MSC, the mean squared error, right? And as we're going to talk about in the second half of this lecture, it's very well known, and it has been for decades, that MSC is an extremely poor proxy for visual similarity between images, right? It's very easy to optimize over, which is why people use it. But it's really crappy when we talk about how similar two images are, right? So we really do need better image to image metrics to be able to make better images too. So kind of the second thing I want to talk about is that you know MSE is bad for perceptual similarity. Okay. So first thing I want to do is kind of discuss improvements to kind of like the vanilla. VAE, right? And the main thing I'm going to talk about today is what's called this VQ VAE. OK, so let's kind of refresh our memory on, um, you know, first we kind of start out with the kind of regular autoencoder, right? So the regular autoencoder would take data points. And again, I want to reemphasize that we're not talking about classification here, but we do have in our examples of like fashion MNIST and faces and so on, we do have some sense of you know, different classes, subclasses inside of our data, right? And so kind of what would happen before would be that, you know, if I have like, you know, circles and squares and triangles and Xs, you know, there was really no guarantee that 
the um, you know, auto-encoded data was well-behaved, right? For example, maybe you know, the origin of the space is here, and all this stuff is kind of off out to the side. And you know, even though these circles are all the same, they're kind of spread out in space. The squares are almost divided by the x's. So the kind of idea behind the VAE was to regularize the encoding in such a way that we kind of try to force everything to be centered on zero with unit covariance. And so kind of like the ideal situation would be something like this, where everyone is kind of like voting for you know, a, a cloud that is near the origin and has close to unit covariance, right? So better behaved, close to Gaussian you know, normal distributions, right? That's kind of like the goal, OK? So the idea behind this new vector quantized VAE is in a way kind of counterintuitive. What we're going to do is we're going to make the latent space discrete, not continuous. Okay, so the kind of key difference with VQVAE is that the latent space is discrete. So in particular, Every input is going to get mapped to a sequence of what are called codebook vectors. And there's only going to be a fixed set of what these vectors can be. right? So let me be a little more precise about that. So uh, each input is mapped to one of a set of uh, I'm going to say a discrete set of n vectors in k-dimensional space, right? So I have, you know, e1 through en. Each of these guys is a vector in k dimensions, and this is called the code book. And so instead. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have a image input. I'm going to have some sort of encoder. Now, the, the encoder is still going to be like your normal kind of, you know, multi-layer deep learning kind of network. And so this is going to produce some sort of a uh, continuous output. And then there is going to be a step of what's called quantization. And then the actual uh, latent you know, object is going to be like a list of vectors, right? So for example, it's going to be just a list of numbers that index which vector I have at each position, right? So this is, for example, saying, you know, vector number. 33, and this is vector number 72, and so on, right? And then this discrete set of code book vectors goes into a decoder, and then out comes the output image. And so that's kind of like the key innovation with this vector quantized thing is that you know if I let the output of the encoder be ZE and then the quantized version be ZQ, what I'm doing is I'm saying that you know ZQ for a given input X is going to be the minimum, the, the vector that's closest to what came out of ZE. So it's like saying, like saying, take the output of the encoder and find me the closest codebook vector to that result, just the closest one in terms of the Euclidean distance, right? So the idea is that, you know, since there's less of this kind of, you know, fuzzy, you know, distributional point cloud nature in the latent space, I'm mapping things to a direct, you know, unit and then mapping back, this is going to in some sense, have some impact on how sharp the images look. Okay, now there are some under the hood um, mechanics of how you make this 
trainable. For example, we know that this like minimum thing is not a differentiable function, and so under the hood, there's some hand waving about how do you actually make this network trainable, right? Um, I don't want to talk about uh, too much. I, I mainly want to focus on kind of like the the loss function and then some of the results. Okay, so it may seem kind of counterintuitive, right, that I take an image or an input and I map it to one of a discrete set of points, right? So, for example, you know, if I had like a 512 dimensional code book, right, 512 vectors, and I had like 500 input samples, well then couldn't I just like map image one to, you know, vector one and image two to vector two and image three to vector three? I wouldn't really be learning anything. It would be just like kind of, it would be very easy to reproduce the input in that way, but I wouldn't be learning anything, right? Well, the answer is that I'm not just mapping the image to a single codebook vector, I'm mapping an image to a sequence of codebook vectors, which has like a high degree of expressibility, right? So for example, you know, let's suppose that, um, you know, in practice, we may have something like, you know, uh, 30 by 32 by 32 array of, you know, this is just an example, a 32 by 32 array of codebook vectors and say that I have 512 options of codebook vectors, then the result is that I have basically, you know, uh, 512 uh, possibilities to the 32 by 32 power, right, which is some huge number, right? So really, you know, there's no problem with this space being able to represent a lot of stuff, right? It's got high, high, um, you know, expressibility, okay? It's a massive space. And so this is, you know, again, kind of like an analog. I mean, it's not a 100% analog, but, you know, there are a lot of connections between this type of thing and, like, image compression, right? So um, if you know about, like, JCOM, JPEG compression or wavelet compression, right, the idea there is that we're taking the input in pixel space and we're moving into some other space where we hope that there is kind of tighter clustering, right? So like the whole point of the JPEG algorithm is we use something called the discrete cosine transform to go from something where I've got, you know, an image where every pixel has a value to the DCT world where it turns out that many of those values are so close to zero that I can ignore them. And by removing those things, I achieve image compression, right? So that's how these, you know, image compression algorithms work is by throwing away information that's not really important. And the same kind of thing is true here. Vector quantization is actually a concept that I think originated in the image compression world, which is why people started to use it here. And so actually, the other, the other thing I'll say is that if you dig into some of these original uh, papers, oftentimes you'll find that they're really talking about compressibility of images as one of their metrics for how well their encoder works, right? Um, we're more concerned with the generative ability in our class, how the images look, but again, you can think about this as something that's useful for you know, decreasing the amount of, of space it takes to store an image, right? Okay, so how do we learn this codebook, right? So the codebook vectors are not defined. The codebook vectors we have to learn to be the best sort of match for the image data that we present, right? So we have to learn the parameters of the encoder, and we also have to learn the uh, you know, vectors that we use to quantize the result. And so there's a lot of stuff to figure out. So um, let me just say what the loss function looks like. So um, how do we learn the codebook? Well, um, the loss has kind of like three parts. And so let me put this on a different piece of paper here. So for example, we might say that the loss is, let me write this down first and I'll talk about kind of what it means. Ba -ding. All right, so there's a lot of weird, unfamiliar terms here, okay? So first of all, let's talk about the top part, right? The top part is basically saying, you know, what I wanna do is I want to minimize the uh, log of this probability, which is saying the x given the quantized, um, you know, uh, latent space vector, right? So it's kind of like saying, I want to make sure that the reconstruction loss is low. So this is, this is basically the same kind of term that we have from 
the normal VAE just kind of cast in a slightly different way, right? So it's basically saying how close is x to g of f of x, okay? Now we have these kind of two weird terms here, right? So this is kind of like, you know, again, the um, part that really optimizes the encoder and the decoder, right? This is more like the VAE part here. Now, this is like stuff that's more related to the code book, okay? And so this SG um, is a kind of a weird function called stop gradient. And basically the idea is, you know, keep this fixed. while optimizing the other. Right, so if, so if any of you have done something that's kind of similar to like, you know, coordinate descent or something like that, where you say, okay, I'm gonna take different steps, I have a bunch of variables to optimize, I'm gonna fix these two and optimize the third, then I'm gonna fix these two and optimize the first. So it's kind of like the same kind of idea where, you know, for the purposes of this term, the encoded, uh, you know, space is fixed, and then these are my code words, right? So in some sense, this is like saying, you know, I want there to be good alignment between, um, so this is called code book alignment. Let me write this over here. This is called code book alignment. The goal here is that we want the uh, raw vectors to be close to the quantized versions. Right, I don't wanna to have to search too far from my continuous output of the encoder to find a good codebook vector, right? So I kinda of wanna make sure that my codebook vectors are not too far away, right? And since I'm in this step, I'm basically allowing myself to move the codebook vectors around to be as close as possible to the stuff that's coming out of the encoder, right? Now here, I've fixed what the COBIT vectors are, and I'm basically allowed to move around the um, quantization. And so this is called the commitment loss. All right, so I'm gonna kind of say here, here, and this is called the commitment loss. And kind of the interpretation of this is, I want to get the embeddings as close as possible to the fixed codebook vectors. So it's a little bit confusing because these are basically the same term just with different things being fixed, right? One is kind of saying, I want the distance between these things to be low, but it's, and it's, it's kind of like saying the same thing in two different ways, right? Except in one case, I'm fixing the codebook, and in one case, I'm fixing the output of the encoder. And I kind of seesaw back and forth between these things. So this is basically, you know, the loss function for this VQVAE. Now you may remember that there was this extra term in the VAE that had this KL divergence kind of thing, right? So one of the things we said at the end of the last lecture was we want to try to force the latent space distributions to look like these zero mean unit Gaussian things, right? Where is that term in here? Well, luckily, we don't have to worry about that at the time that we train the VQVAE. So let me just say that um, this is our kind of like training loss function that, that happens in the first phase. So let's just say what happened to that KL divergence term from regular VAE. So during training, we're basically gonna have an agnostic prior, a uniform prior over all these quantized uh, latent codes, right? So basically uh, not present in this VQ VAE the way we're talking about it. The idea is that we kind of assume what I call uniform prior over um, you know, all latent codes. So in that case, 
that's like saying that the, you know, the KL term would basically be like a constant, so there's no need to include it at all. There's no ambiguity about what quantized codebook vector a given input is mapped to, right? So there's no, just like, so in the VAE, we were, we were going from a input vector to kind of an uncertain distribution. In the VQVE, we're going right from input vector to an unambiguous, you know, latent space vector. There's no screwing around. Similar to like the original autoencoder, there was no ambiguity there either, right? So the idea is that we train the VAE and then we fix this embedding, right? So we train the VQVAE and we fix the embedding. And then there's one final step, which is that, you know, now we need to sample from this to generate new images, right? So there has to be some sort of sense of what is the distribution of the data in this latent space, right? It's definitely not gonna be uniform. We're, we're kind of assuming that is for the training, but it's not gonna be the case in practice. So we need one extra step in order to sample, right? So um, we need one more step of learning a prior, a non-uniform prior, over the latent space, right? Which I can think of like the probability of a latent vector z. And then we can sample from this learned prior in order to generate our new results, okay? One way of thinking about this is that if the prior is non-uniform, we can compress the image into even fewer bits, right? So like, you know, you probably learned about Huffman coding in some point in your career, right? So Huffman coding is a way of taking, you know, like, like Morse code is kind of like an example of Huffman coding, right? You could use an equal number of bits for every letter that you transmit in Morse code, but it doesn't make any sense to do that because some letters are more probable than others. You want to assign short code words to E and A and long code words to Z and Q, right? Same kind of idea here. We want to learn a, a non-uniform prior over the latent space so we can be as kind of compact as possible. Okay, and so the non-uniform prior is learned using a model called pixel CNN. So um, this non-uniform prior comes from something called pixel CNN. And pixel CNN is, is basically an autoregressive model for building up a patch of pixels, okay? So the idea is that my prior is something where it's like, well, if I have a, uh, you know, if I have a grid of latents, for example, right? So if I call this, you know, Z1, Z2, Z3, and so on, I model this whole probability of this whole thing as first some probability of Z1, then I have a conditional probability of Z2 given Z1, then I have a conditional probability of Z3 given Z1 and Z2, and so on, all the way out to the whole thing. And this whole thing is the probability of everything happening at once. So kind of an easy way to think about this is that at any given point, what I'm doing is I'm predicting what this value should be given all of the stuff that happened up to that point, right? So I'm only using information, if you, again, from a signal consistence perspective, this is like what's called a causal model, right? I'm only kind of using previous information to generate my current thing. Also kind of known as an autoregressive model, right? In, in a way that I'm like kind of building the current output from a set of previous outputs, okay? Um, and so this is in contrast to like a normal CNN, right? So a normal CNN, if I'm going to, so this, this is like pixel CNN. A normal CNN is more like saying, what's going on at this pixel is actually related to the entire neighborhood, right? I have this convolutional neighborhood that's like a filter that sits on top of my given pixel and is using kind of pixels from further down the image and further to the right of my pixel. So this is in some sense kind of like looking to the future of pixels, right? Whereas here, I'm generating pixels on the fly, okay? And so 
you can actually make this work kind of in a normal CNN by making a mask that kind of says that any weights on future pixels should just be zero, right? So you'll see this kind of like masking inside the implementation of these CNNs. That's kind of what's going on, is to make the, make the network causal, you kind of have this little extra mask that you can still use all your other CNN stuff. And of course, there are other ways of, of doing this, like you know, if you've heard of LSTMs or RNNs, there are other ways of kind of like modeling this kind of like you know, recursive learning network. You can use transformers, you can do all, all sorts of stuff. But the original VQVA paper used pixel CNN to do its prior model. Okay. And so let me just show you know, f first of all, the um, original papers are on the. Um, on the wiki or the um, GitHub, right? So the first paper is basically the original Pixel CNN paper, and the second paper is this neural discrete learning paper, which is actually the, under the hood the VQVAE paper. So let's just see. So it's a little bit, um, you know, VQVAE is in the abstract, but it's not actually in the title. The title is called Neural Discrete Representation Learning. So this was a group of people from DeepMind in 2017, I believe. So not that long ago. Um, and so again, if you want to read more about it, because I realize that you know, in half an hour, I can only give a very hand wavy explanation of what's going on here. If you want to really dig into this, then this is where you'd go to read the paper, right? Um, and you can see much of what I said is drawn from this paper, right? Um, and then the results of the paper are kind of the following. So here, what we kind of see is that the images on the left are true images actual images from different classes of this, of this database called ImageNet. And the right-hand side are VQVAE reconstructions of those images. And we can kind of see immediately that they are a lot sharper than the things that we were getting out of the regular VAE, right? So this is kind of one reason why people preferred this version is because the generated images were immediately of higher quality, okay? Um, now again, these are only like kind of like the closest images that I could get from encoding and decoding a given point, right? Now we want to look at what is the generative ability of these models, right? What kinds of entirely new pictures can they represent? And so there the results are good, but not like, you know, 100% there yet, right? So for example, here what we're seeing is the left to right, the columns correspond to these classes that are uh, fox, gray whale, brown bear, admiral butterfly, coral reef, alp, microwave, and pickup, right? And so, you know, some of these look kind of credible, you know, like this kind of looks like a truck and this kind of looks like a, you know, a mountaintop and these look like coral reefs. But if you kind of zoom in on like the animals, definitely, you know, these kind of look bear-like, but they don't look like actual bears, right? So clearly something has been learned about what bears look like, but it's not 100% there yet. But even, even then, the images that we're generating are much sharper than the ones that would come out of a regular VAE, right? Um, and so uh, we did try this at home. So here we did a local implementation of VQVAE, thanks to Zhongyi back there who worked hard on this. And it took a while for it to work, right? It wasn't like immediate getting it to work. Uh, and we just used a few classes. We used cat, dog, and I believe wildlife or something like that, which is like tigers and lions and stuff like that. So again, these are our local results running on the machine downstairs where the reconstructions of the true images look okay. Uh, and then we train the pixel CNN to generate the prior, and then we decode. And so now what you see here are, you know, the attempted uh, cats, dogs, and wildlife. And, you know, again, if you look at the top row, clearly these are kind of cat-like, right? Like I think the, probably the most successful one is something like this maybe, or maybe like this. Um, the other ones look like kind of mangled cat pictures. Uh, and the dogs kind of look like dogs. And the wildlife, you see some like leopard spots and cheetah skin and stuff like that. But it's not quite there yet, right? So um, yeah, I feel like we did a pretty credible version of the same kinds of results that you see in the paper, right? But again, just like I said before, the, you know, the initial seed often leads to better research, right? And so um, one thing let me say before I forget is that the VAE idea, right, this kind of vector quantized thing, is really the um, basis for what's under the hood of uh, the original version of Dolly, right? So Dolly 1, right, you guys are used to Dolly 2, but the first Dolly, which I don't think they called Dolly 1, they just called it Dolly, um, used a, you know, something similar to 
a VQVAE under the hood. They call it DVAE. I don't remember what the D stands for. Um, and it's a little bit different in the sense that, so this was in 2021. Um, you know, it's a little bit different in the sense that uh, instead of having an image that we map to a vector of code book entries, right? So kind of what we were saying before is I have a bunch of, you know, code book indices. Uh, we instead map to what's kind of like a PMF over the embedding space. Right, so the way I understand it is that we have an image and then for each of these slots, what we really have is something like, you know, the probability that the code book is number one and then the probability that the code book is number two. So it's kind of like, you know, these all sum to one. So it's kind of like a discrete, you know, PMF over the possible code book entries. And then you sample from this distribution in the decoder. And again, there are some bazillion tricks to make this work and make it tractable, right? So again, that's one of the other reasons I just wanted to very briefly touch on VQVAEs is because this was kind of like the encoding part of the original DALI. Uh, and then the encoding part of the new DALI is, you know, like diffusion and transformer based, right? So we'll talk about DALI 2 in a few weeks, but this is like where DALI 1 kind of started from. Um, Okay, and before I leave this topic, I'll, I'll give you a chance to ask questions in a second. I just want to say that there was then another version of this that came out that is kind of like the sequel, VQVAE2, right? So, um, you know, VQVAE2, the innovation here, again, basically by the same group at DeepMind, um, you know, one thing that we know so far is that the ability to create new images is fairly limited to fairly low resolution images, right? Like 32 by 32 or 64 by 64, you know? So the innovation of this was to enable much, much higher resolution output, right? So this, the key innovation was to enable like high res output. You know, for example, you know, 1024 by 1024 images. So I can show you quickly what the kind of comparative results look like, right? So this is what I showed the figure from VQVA, the original paper, and these are results from VQVA2, where now if I generate these kind of class specific things, well, certainly there's been some improvement under the hood because now when I generate things that look like poodles, they all look pretty reasonable. And um, here I generate a bunch of spaniels. I don't know what this person doesn't look like a spaniel, but I'm not sure what happened there. Uh, and then these are like very high resolution faces that came out of VQVA2, and now something is cooking, right? Now these look like the kinds of fake humans that we're used to kind of seeing from like other generative models, right? So this puts us in about 2019 as a state of the art for, you know, generating models, especially for human faces. This is like kind of, I'm not sure why this woman has green hair, but you know, this was like, again, suddenly making things that you might not be able to tell were not real people, right? Going from these blurry fuzzy faces to really sharp faces. And so I can just say briefly that the idea that enabled this was to use a hierarchical VQVAE, right? So the uh, enabling technology was to use kind of like a hierarchical system. The idea is that, and again, this is very hand wavy, the idea was that I would have like an original image and then I would um, encode it into a lower resolution image and I would encode that again into an even smaller image. So say for example, if the original was 256 by 256, I might take one step to go down to 64 by 64 and another step to go down to 32 by 32 then I would vector quantize my results to make like a set of codebook vectors at this kind of low level. And again, since I've made this image so much smaller, 
this is kind of like a very small, low detail version of the original image. The only thing that we left after I do this subsampling is very coarse, you know, like color differences and like big picture patterns, right? So this is what I would call like kind of like the global information. While this layer still has some edges and details that are visible, so the idea would be that I have a um, another quantization here that makes a set of tile or a set of codebook vectors at this next broader scale, and these are like fine details that are conditioned on the above. And then to do the actual uh, decoding, basically I take you know the output of this and the output of this, and then I have my reconstructed image at the original scale. So I realize this is very hand wavy, and to be honest, I don't fully understand it myself. But the key idea is that what we're doing is we're making a multi-scale version of the image. So we have kind of like a coarse to fine or a, or a big to small thing. And again, if you've ever done anything that's like kind of wavelet encoding and stuff like that, kind of a similar idea where I'm reducing the image successively in size. And then at every scale, I have some sort of vector quantized, you know, coefficients. So the latent space is not just like one place. It's a latent space that happens at the highest scale, the middle scale, the lowest scale, and so on. And I use all that stuff to reconstruct the original image. And that hierarchy enables me to generate bigger images because you know, this image is not forced to learn everything at once. Like I, I learned some stuff here with a few coefficients, and then I keep on kind of like adding detail in a hand wavy way with these higher level VQ coefficients, right? Because this, this quantization here is not doing all the work on its own. It's conditioned on what happened at the lower level, so it's not having to figure everything out. It's only figuring out the stuff that's not already included in the lower level. So, you know, that was something that, um, you know, again, generated a lot of interest because suddenly I could make these, these pretty good faces, okay? Now, I will say that my understanding more or less is that then, you know, kind of GANs came on the scene, and next week is going to be our introduction to GANs. We're going to talk about that for at least three lectures. And suddenly people basically started using GANs instead of VAEs, right? So I don't want to dwell a lot on this because I don't think that VAEs is like kind of like the, the current like best technology. In fact, now everyone's using diffusion models instead of using GANs, right? But this is kind of like the historical development of this stuff. And again, you can see that this is not that old, right? Neurops 19 was four years ago, right? So uh, that's not so bad, right? Um, it's really gone leaps and bounds. Uh, this was still at the point where you were only generating images of a certain class, right? There was not this idea of text prompt to generate an image that had a bunch of stuff that was combined together. We're definitely gonna talk about that you know, as we go further. So kind of what I want to do in terms of layout is, first we'll talk about, you know, uh, we're finished talking about VAEs, then we'll talk about GANs, then we'll talk about diffusion models, then we'll talk about language a little bit, and then we'll talk about how all that comes together to be able to generate kind of arbitrary looking images of whatever we want from the text prompt, right, that are no longer tied to these classes. Okay, so let me pause and ask about questions or comments to the extent that I can answer them. One thing I will say, oh, question, yeah. Yeah, the DIVA, DVAE, right? Yeah. Is it that there's multiple like code blocks that have probabilities to show up? Or is it like, are those probabilities describing? So I believe that what's happening is that, you know, I basically am mapping the image to a PMF for each of these sections. Right, yeah. So it's kind of like a joint PMF for every. I don't know what the dimensionality, I think, did I write down here? Uh, so let me just write on here. So what I have in my notes is that the original Dolly took a 256 by 256 RGB image and then turned that into a 32 by 32 grid of tokens. And then, uh, you know, with 8,192 vectors in the codebook. So the encoder is basically saying, I have a 32 by 32 grid. For each of those places, I have 8,000 options, right? And then I have a PMF for each of those grid spaces of what those 8,000 options should be. That's my understanding of it. 
So one thing that I will say in my summer of reading about this stuff is that, you know, the original papers are often tough to understand, right? But there are a lot of, like, people that are your age or not that much older who are writing these, like, you know, VQVAE2 explained blog posts, which are not always 100% accurate, but they do often, like, give a little bit of additional understanding to just reading the raw papers, right? Um, and so I definitely endorse, you know, going back and doing some of that. In fact, I think in my, um, my browser here. So, yeah, so here's an example of one of these things, right? So understanding VQVAE is, actually this is a Berkeley blog post that for whatever reason is no longer online, so I linked to the Wayback Machine. Um, and this is kind of like when DALI first came out, people were like super excited about how it worked and trying to figure out what it did, right? And so this kind of is, you know, covering, you know, these are the famous Dali, like armchair in the shape of the avocado. Uh, and then here you can see other people's attempt to explain VQVAEs and what the difference is. And so you can see I, I drew from this a little bit when I was writing my lecture. So again, if you're interested in this stuff, you know, go back and take a look at some of these blog posts that let you kind of go through it at your own pace. Um, in fact, you can see I hopefully did a pretty good job of summarizing what they said here. Um, Okay, other questions or comments? Okay, so one other thing that I wanna talk about, which I think is actually much more uh, kind of like tractable and understandable, is how can we assess how good an image result is, right? Because now we're getting to the point where if I wanna say, you know, this face generation looks better than that face generation, right? How can I tell, you know, quantitatively that that's the case? Like if I'm making my new algorithm, how am I gonna convince the research community that these are better, right? So um, this has been a problem in image processing for a long, long time, right? So for example, you know, a key concept from, you know, a key issue in image compression is, you know, if I turn my JPEG slider all the way down to, you know, lowest quality and look at the comparison between my compressed image and my current image, like, how bad is it, right? Like how, how much can I turn that knob down before it starts looking really bad, right? We need to have some sort of quantitative way of talking about that, okay? And so there are two classes of image kind of quality methods that I wanna talk about. Again, all of which kind of came out of the, I mean, they, they started in the image processing world, but then they kind of turned into deep learning based uh, metrics, right? So how can we assess how good a generated images. And again, this is all tangled up with human perception and, you know, like the million years of evolution of our brain to recognize, you know, faces and animals and stuff like that, right? So it's not an easy problem to solve, right? There are basically two classes of methods, right? So there's something called full reference methods. Uh, not models, methods. Basically, the idea is to compare, you know, some sort of original image versus some sort of a processed or reconstructed image. So, for example, when we're talking about, you know, um, taking the decoded, encoded output of a VAE, we had the original image, we have what came out, and we can say how close are these two things, right? I've got the, the gold standard ground truth original thing to compare it to, okay? Um, and so, you know, the original kind of methods were like, you know, MSE, right? So MSE is basically like, you know, I look at the average of all of the pixels of the, you know, truth versus all the pixels of the reconstructed, and I look at the average error, right? It's easy to use in a training method, but as I'll show you in a second, it sucks as a perceptual quality metric, right? And also kind of related to MSE is PSNR, which is the, um, I'm, I'm blanking on what the P stands for in PSNR. SNR is single noise ratio. Um, what does the P stand for? Who knows what the P stands for? Peak, I think, single noise ratio, is that right? Something like that, embarrassing. But anyway, it's basically the same thing as the MSE, right? So it's related to the sum of squared errors, okay? And so it's so mathematically easy, but it's known that it doesn't correlate 
re really well with perception, right? And so some of the earliest work on this kind of observation uh, came in 2004. And so if we go to this picture, so this is a picture from um, a famous paper by Wang et al. and Al Bovic's group where we look at the upper left-hand picture, right? So the upper left-hand picture is the original, and all of these five images have exactly the same MSE, okay? So this one is basically just like contrast stretched. This one is, uh, you know, shifted up so it's a little bit brighter. This one is like a poorly JPEG compressed image. This is a blurry image, and this is an image that looks like it's got a bunch of its pixels randomly flipped to black or white. All these, all these comparisons would give you exactly the same MSE, right? And of course, that's a huge problem, right? Because clearly, we as humans would probably pick like image C, for example, as being the closest thing, right? And we'd say that image E or image D is really bad, right? So that set off a whole bunch of research on, okay, so how can we design fully automated ways to make a metric that kind of, or a measurement that kind of correlates well with human judgment. And so their proposal was coming, something called the SSIM, Structural Similarity Image Metric, I believe. And so the next development in um, perceptual stuff was the SSIM, which was around 2004. And so this was, again, pre-deep learning, right? So it's basically like a weighted combination of um, a weighted combination of things like edges, contrast, structure. These are all things that you ha can kind of get from basic low-level image processing. Right? We want the luminance to be correct. We want the edges to be similar. We want the contrast to be the same. You know, um, it's certainly better than MSE, but we can definitely do better than this also. Um, so, you know, again, around the same time, there was something called IFC. I don't remember what this stands for, but this is kind of like the same idea in the wavelet domain. So if you know anything about wavelets, again, right around the 2000s, wavelets for image compression and image representation were a super hot topic, and it turned out that you could do a pretty good job representing these kinds of things in the wavelet world. But with the advent of neural networks, suddenly the image comparison metrics took on a whole different flavor, okay? And so um, someone was, you were asking last time about perceptual image quality, so this is where we're going now, right? Is that, you know, around, so then we have kind of like the line, and then deep learning kind of starts now, right? So below the line, we have basically like VGG is a um, network from Oxford, so this was probably in 2015, 2016. So this basically looks at the L2 distance, like the Euclidean distance between feature maps of a deep neural network. And this neural network was basically, you know, originally designed for image classification. So this is kind of like around this time is that there were a lot of contests on can you do a good job of classifying images into cats and dogs and houses and whatnot, right? So this was originally for image classification, but it was kind of observed that a byproduct was to basically, you know, put these images like the raw and the uh, processed image into this VGD network and look at what the outputs are at different layers of the network. Not necessarily at the very end where you're doing classification, but in the middle and the, and the you know, different you know, levels of the network, you can kind of compare what is this vector compared to that vector, right? And that turned out to work pretty well. Um, and then there was a development called LPIPS, which I know that one of these stands for perception, but I'm not sure what the rest of the letters stand for. So LPIPS was basically around 2018, combination of people from Berkeley and OpenAI and Adobe. So this was based on a set of experiments that kind of took the same idea to find the, you know, best, or at least to find good layers of various networks. To match as well as possible with human judgment. 
And this was kind of a cool idea, right? So instead of like just kind of like observing that these layers in the networks seem to match well with human judgment, they did these pretty detailed human experiments where they kept on asking people, okay, you know, actually I have a picture of it. So where is it? Right, so they would basically ask people, you know, which of these patches is closer to the middle, right? A or B. And so you can see here that they score kind of like what humans would say, what you'd get with something like PSNR or SSIM, and then we get with various networks. And so, you know, for comparison, right, like as a human, you would definitely say that the, you know, patch one is closer on the left, and you'd say that patch zero is closer on the right because there's this kind of like chromatic aberration. And then you'd say that patch zero is also closer on the far right, right? Um, and so it's tricky to get a, you know, set of layers. And they, as I recall correctly, it wasn't just one layer, they were looking at combinations of layers. Um, and so this is also a very interesting read, this paper. Um, this is kind of showing again that if you look at different metrics, they can give you very different uh, outputs for how similar two things are, right? So for example, um, you know, if you go based on this SSIM metric from, you know, left to right, um, you know, it's saying that these things are far apart and these things are close together, which is sometimes true, but like over here, you could see that like these things don't seem very close compared to like these things over here. And then on the other hand, you know, you've got this kind of, uh, you know, network based on a GAN where they're kind of using metrics to tell whether it's near or far. It's very hard to get these things that all agree with what humans would think. It's a cool paper to read and I suggest that you check it out. Um, and so, it's not necessarily so easy, I don't think, to optimize because you can't necessarily have this extra whole layer on top of your you know, loss function. But it is a way that people can use to compare like how good are the outputs versus the outputs from some other network, right? So if you're talking about the quality of a you know, autoencoder type network, you could definitely compare A versus B by seeing which one had a better LPIP score, right? And so um, these days, that's kind of like, I think, for full reference comparison, pretty much a great thing to, to try, right? However, um, we don't always or often have the actual original image to compare something to, right? And so, um, you know, the other type of image comparison is what's called no reference uh, image quality, right? So um, the idea behind no reference image quality With this, you're just presented with some output and you want to know how good is it, right? So there's no ground truth to compare it to, just kind of like, you know, how natural is it? How realistic is it, you know? Um, so kind of the way that you can attack this problem from a neural network perspective is kind of saying, you know, is this representation a good sample that kind of goes along with the probability distribution of all the inputs that I saw, right? So kind of that's the philosophy is that, you know, um, is this a good sample from the, you know, distribution of objects that look like this? So this is something that's really important for stuff like GANs, because GANs are generating these totally, you know, images that came out of nowhere. But I will say that, you know, most of these no reference metrics here depend on you knowing that your generated image is in some sort of a known class, like it's a face or it's a dog or it's a cat or it's a type of dog, right? Like you can't just like apply this to, like I take a picture of this world and I say, okay, so how good is this image, right? That's not a very well-defined problem, right? I wanna know if I take a picture of this face, okay, does this look like a human face? That's a more well-defined problem, okay? Um, and so you're gonna see a couple of common measures, especially as you look at the GAN literature. Um, a key one is called the inception score. And a lot of times, let me just also say that, you know, a lot of times you're not necessarily only scoring a single image. You're scoring like the ensemble of images that this thing can produce, right? So what, what I might do is I might take my candidate GAN and I might ask it to generate a thousand faces and I ask as a collective, 
how good are these thousand faces, right? And it's not so much that I'm like just saying, okay, well, how good is this one or how good is that one, right? Because cherry picking, you, you could get a bad output or a particularly good output, right? So these are usually used on an ensemble of outputs, bless you, not just a single image. And so um, inception, the word inception comes from this famous Google network that would basically output the probability that your image was in a given class, right? So again, much of this original deep learning work came out of image classification. And so, you know, the inception network, forget about exactly how it worked. Basically what it would do is it would produce a um, probability that, you know, an image is in a given class. And there were like a thousand possibilities. And so kind of the idea behind the inception score is that if I show you an image, right, and the image is of something, a cat or a face, then this probability should be very peaked at one of the classes, right? So, you know, if the image is kind of like of something, the idea is that P of Y given X, where this is a class label and this is an image, you know, this basically should be high. You know, for some class. And conversely, it should be low for other classes. Right? So if I show you a picture of a cat, I should have something that's saying, hey, it's 0.99 cat and 0.001 dog and 0.0001 fish and so on, right? So we want there to be a very peaked conditional probability distribution that says, hey, yes, I think this is in the given class, okay? But the ensemble part is that we also want the generated objects that we make if I ask for a thousand things, we also want those generated images to be diverse, right? We want them to kind of span the whole mass of probability that corresponds to that class. Because I don't want to have something where, for example, if I'm always generating the same person's face, right? Well, then it would be great on this score because it would be like, hey, yes, that's a face, right? But we don't want the network to learn to always make that face, right? We want it to have a, a wide diversity of all the kinds of faces that it can make, right? So in addition to this being high, we also want high diversity in the generated images. Which is like saying that if I look at the generated images, this distribution really should be as flat as possible, right? Um, so, you know, this should basically be um, you know, it should be flat. Lots of possibilities. So, basically, um, this is kind of like saying um, well, let me make sure I got this right. So why is the label, right? Yeah, okay. And so kind of what we want to do is, um, I've got this thing that says, I want to look at the, you know, look at the KL divergence. Between P of Y given X, and now I'm getting a little bit stumped on my notes because I have in my notes P of Y. Seems like what I want is P of X. So let me think for just a second here. So we want the marginal distribution, which is this, of the images generated to have low entropy, i.e. many different possibilities. But this, that would mean I have high entropy. So kind of what I want is that, you know, oh, 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 I see, I see. Okay, so let me take it back. So 
if I'm thinking about, okay, now I see what it feels. So if I'm thinking about the um, class, like, so when I have a GAN, like, you might make a GAN that works on ImageNet classes, for example, right? And so what I want to do is have the thing be able to generate instances of all the classes, right? So actually what I want is that, you know, this P of Y, right? If I think about all the labels that my thing can produce should be pretty high, right? I think that's the philosophy. And so this is like saying, you know, here I want, you know, each image has a distinct label, but I want there to be many different labels that I can generate. And I want to make this big, right? Because I want this to be sharply peaked and this to be relatively flat. I believe that's the way it works. So this kind of only makes sense when you're talking about generative models that are kind of tied to a specific set of classes, right? Um, it doesn't work so well when you're talking about like, you know, I don't know whether like mangoes are in Inception, but like if I choose some sort of noun that is not in my, you know, uh, set of ImageNet classes, then this is not very well suited. Because the Inception network only really works on these, a thou on these thousand specific named classes, OK? Um, and on top of that Inception score, you'll also see, see something called the Frische Inception distance, which is like a modification of the Inception distance. Or the FID. So it's basically a modification of the normal inception score that considers the kind of like statistics of real world examples. And so the idea there is that um, what we do is we use an inception, the inception network, to generate feature vectors of both real and, you know, synthesized images. And then I model these feature vectors by Gaussians, right? So I basically have like mu real sigma real and mu synthesize, sigma synthesized. And then I want to basically compare these two Gaussians, right? I want these two distributions to be similar, right? So we want these distributions to be similar, right? So a different way of saying this is that you know, if I generate a thousand cat pictures, I want the feature vector distribution of those generated pictures to resemble the feature distribution of all the cat pictures that I saw in my training data, right? I'm trying to kind of make sure that my output is as representative as possible as the input, okay? And so we talked last time about, was it last time or the time before, about, you know, there are ways of comparing two different distributions, and in particular, we could use this Frische distance between Gaussians, right? So here, this is like saying, how similar is this multidimensional Gaussian and this multidimensional Gaussian? And then the formula for that is just a simple manipulation of the um, means and the covariances. So just for, just for the record, you can take these things and arrive at a number that tells you how similar these things are, right? So it's kind of like a measurement of how similar two Gaussians are. And so if you look at a GAN paper, you're going to see columns and columns of numbers that are like inception score and FID, right? And that's what those two things mean. The original papers that introduced these things, it's not like there's a single paper called the inception score and a single paper called the Frisian inception distance. Basically, if you go back and try to track down where these things are introduced, it's like, you know, a small paragraph in some other paper, right? So. Um, you know, generally, again, you have to kind of dig around to find out what the definitions of these things actually are. One of the things that, again, I linked to on the um, GitHub is 
just an example of um, you know, image quality metrics. This one is by someone named Tabitha Oanda. And so uh, this goes into like, you know, how are you gonna compare whether A or B is more realistic or whether A or B is more realistic, right? Um, and so this talks about inception, for Shea inception, um, and then these are the other ones where you actually have a, um, a reference image to compare to. So we go back to LPIPs and SSIM and so on. So if you're interested in kind of like, you know, reading a little more about it, then this is a place and this, this blog post has the papers where these things were kind of uh, proposed later on down here, right? Um, so in particular, the LPIPs paper is pretty interesting to read. I recommend that one. Okay, so questions or comments? All right, so I will talk about basically the next three lectures are gonna be all about GANs, right? So the first lecture on Monday is gonna be kind of like introduction to the basic idea of GANs. The next lecture is gonna be on um, basically advanced GANs because a GAN is not like a single network. There's like hundreds of different kinds of GANs that are used for different things, right? And so we'll talk about some of the famous ones. For example, you know, there's one called style GAN, and big GAN, and there's something called GAN space. And then the final lecture on GANs is gonna be on, um, you know, taking an image and turning it into another image, right? So there's a lot of like image filter stuff that I'm sure you've seen in apps. That's where all that stuff comes from. Uh, and also, I wanna spend about half of that lecture talking about uh, going back to this creativity aspect of how have artists used these computational tools, right? So there are a lot of GAN artists that kind of came to prominence in the mid 2010s. And I wanna talk a little bit about what they made and how they made it. Um, and then maybe that will give you some, some inspiration. So, okay, any comments or questions? All right, so with that, I will stop the recording.